Hello, I'm Dr. Tess Laurie. Welcome to Tess Talks. Today I'm speaking with Sean Bakovich and Robert Fusaro. They are two very brave men who were perfectly healthy before they received the COVID-19 shots and their health and their lives have changed radically since then. Sean, would you like to tell us your experience first and where you are now, two years into your vaccine injury? Sure, Tess. Thanks for having me. So as you know, um, I'm a nurse practitioner based in New York City, and I received uh, two doses of the Pfizer vaccine early on as a medical health professional. I had a reaction almost immediately on my right side in my injected arm that went up into my face, my eye uh and my ear and i was ill-advised to proceed with a second dose against my own better medical judgment but because the employer was mandating the vaccine i had to proceed or lose my job so i got the second dose in my left arm it sparked all the paresthesias in my right side and then things just progressed rapidly to severe tinnitus facial neuropathies that went on to full body neuropathies. I had autonomic dysfunction, which involved positional tachycardia, severe insomnia. I have muscle fasciculations. I had internal tremors and electrical zaps on various parts of my body. Um, and then I, my uh, cardiac uh, arrhythmias evolved now into atrial fibrillation. So I'm 53 years old. Prior, I had no medical history. I was on no medications or supplements. I was at the height of my medical career. So this has turned my life upside down. I've been on uh, disability for the past year and a half because of the severe debilitating nature of my symptoms. So that's a brief overview. I've now reached my two-year vaxiversary, I call it, on January 19th. And I think the thing that I would like to highlight today is that we are two years into this, many of us in the vaccine injured community. And what we haven't seen really is any action to help research us, provide remedies and uh, investigated therapeutics in a, in a coordinated manner to alleviate our symptoms. Um, zero response from the manufacturers. I think it's, you know, by nature, they don't want to touch us because we're not good for marketing the vaccine, right? But our own government, I think, has abandoned us. They failed to put a, a system in place to address these types of prolonged adverse reactions. And I think that that is one of the biggest uh, downfalls of the rollout of these vaccines. So that's a little bit of what I wanted to highlight today is where take stock, where are we two years into this uh, and kind of reflect back. Yes, we've talked about the harms of the vaccine, the different types of reactions that we've seen, the potential um, injuries that they could cause. But now the rhetoric really needs to move to action to help us right? We, we need research. And I think Robert will speak a little bit to this about really what's not happening. Um, so I'll kind of hand it over to him now and he can, he can kind of elaborate on that part and then we can circle back. How's that? Sounds good to me. Thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, I, I'd pretty much uh, have to agree with everything Sean said so far. Um, I, I may actually take it a, a little further and say, um, what I'm seeing happening is is not just um, them not following up, but it's willful negligence. And and to me, that's that's the most concerning part is that we have a, a system, uh, you know, our government and the medical system that both seem to be working together to pretend that we don't exist. And and that to me is incredibly concerning. I mean, a lot a lot of people don't want to say that, but that's the reality of where we're at at this point. That. Uh, I mean, let, let's call a doc a doc. I mean, the the system has has failed us, and they're willfully failing us. The uh, the CDC, the NIH, uh, you know, a lot of these government bodies are aware of what's happening to us. They've been aware since before the vaccines were officially rolled out when they did the trials, 
and they still refuse to publicly acknowledge what's happening to us. They still minimize what's happening to us. Um, and then, you know, social media and, and the mainstream media basically pretend that we don't exist. I mean, it's basically a handful of, of, you know, outlets like yourself and, and other brave people that are trying to get the truth out there that they're admitting to what's happening to us. And to me, that, that reflects on, on, on something beyond just, you know, uh, negligence i mean this this to me at this point seems like it's intentional that they're trying to pretend that we're not here and and i ask why they're doing that um i mean for me it's, it's pretty simple to think well if they ever admit that something happened to us that means that they're liable for something right um but at this point you know what are human lives worth what are people's health worth um like sean said there's a lot of people that are two years into this now i mean i um just, just a brief background on me. I, um, I was perfectly healthy before, just like Sean, I had no issues. Um, I did have COVID in March of 2020. Uh, I had that for about 10 days. Uh, I recovered after that. Uh, I had a little bit of fatigue, uh, for a couple of weeks, but I went back to a normal life. I was working full time from home, uh, working outside, um, uh, exercising, you know, four or five days a week. Uh, I was in perfect health. I mean, uh, I think a week before I uh, I got the vaccines, I uh, ended up cutting down and logging up an entire tree by myself. So I wouldn't say I was an unhealthy person. Uh, I ended up getting the vaccines 15 months after COVID. Um, so no no relation to the original COVID infection. 15 months later, uh, I got the two Pfizer vaccines, just like Sean. And uh, I ended up with uh, three weeks to the day after the second shot, I ended up with a complete heart block. Uh, emergency pacemaker surgery, uh, pericarditis, DVT and clots in my arm. Uh, let's see, cardiac tamponade, uh, two more emergency surgeries to drain the blood out of my heart. And then another one to remove the pacemaker that I no longer needed. Um, trigeminal neuralgia, occipital neuralgia, uh, every kind of uh, fasciculation and uh, neurological issue you could think of. Um, burning small fiber neuropathy in my hands, feet, face. Uh, I will say most of that's gone away now, except for my feet. Uh, I ended up with uh, dysautonomia now. Uh, I have, I, I mean, the list could go on and on. We could talk all day about the, the layers and layers of damage that, that we've all sustained. Um, and I don't think anything in the history of, of vaccines or medicine has ever caused this kind of damage uh, to this many people. I mean, we've heard about, you know, with the original swine flu outbreak and SARS-CoV-1 and the original SARS vaccine and the damage that did to people, uh, a lot of other vaccines that have done things to people. But again, I I've never seen anything like this. So to me, it's, it's just, it's crushing to see that there's so many of us out there. I see the groups. I mean, I'm in the groups and not just on Facebook, but on Reddit, on Twitter, on all different kinds of social media. There's hundreds of thousands of people that are severely, severely damaged. Um, there's people taking their lives every day. There's people that, that have no outlets to turn to. And, um, yeah. and the worst part I think of all that's this, a good, I think that's a very good point you make there that we want, I want to highlight about the, what we're seeing in the increase in suicide rates among the injured because of their despair now at two years, because they're not able to get access medical one. They're not able to access medical the medical system and get medical help but i think at the root of all of this is just pure acknowledgement if somebody would just acknowledge the scientific fact that reactions happen right there is no one no drug that is 100 percent safe and to pretend otherwise is a farce right so we know reactions can happen so that's the starting premise and then if we could just acknowledge that yes some people have been harmed we don't we don't have to get into the debates about the degrees but i mean people have been harmed they have been seriously harmed and that that lack of acknowledgement has prevented them from getting medical treatment and research and they are left to worsen so that is what in fact happened to me after my injury i i i chased down every every medical professional across the country for months and I just kept getting run around and run around and worsening and worsening and worsening. 
And my despair was just increasing. And, uh, and that is what is happening now. And, uh, you know, we need to, we need to plug this drain to try to keep these people alive till we get help. Yeah. Many people who are still under the impression that vaccine adverse events are a rare thing. And, um, and particularly among people who've been vaccinated, um, they may, uh, think that it's rare, particularly because the official narrative is still that the vaccines are safe and effective. So only yesterday right. on Twitter, the World Health Organization was, uh, saying that don't attribute your symptoms to, uh, your post vaccination symptoms to the vaccine. They may have nothing to do with it. Um, you know, what, what would you say to people who are believing that they are safe and effective and that vaccine adverse events are a rare right. thing? I would say, how how do we know if we're not actively looking and if we're not openly talking about it, right? So we, Rob and I know we're we're hidden from sight, right? We can speak on some platforms, but mainstream media basically does not want to discuss it, right? So if we are all hidden and lurking in the shadows. How will we ever know what is rare and what isn't? And to that point is like we we can't fear vaccine hesitancy to such a degree that we never know true harms, right? If you can't discuss and critique a medicine and you hold it on such a high pedestal that you cannot scrutinize it, How is that in any way safe for humanity? Everything in science should be open to scrutiny, fair scrutiny. I'm not talking wild conspiracy theories or fringe thinking, you know, but uh, true science says we should question everything and look at the evidence. And the media is the big is is the is the other disappointment here, right? Their job is not to be complicit complicit and and just echoing the message of the manufacturers and the government they are to question right to investigate to question prove us wrong if uh if we are rare get out there meet us i have not had any one mainstream journalist come to my house to talk to me to look through my medical records to validate me so i think that is the core there right And then I think the last point I would make is who determines when the risks are greater than the benefit, right? And how, so how many people must be harmed? How many people must be proven to have died before something like this is questioned? And who determines that? Like what, what degree is it? 10 people, 20, a hundred, a thousand? I mean, we are human. We are human lives. With the swine flu vaccine, um, there were um, fifty deaths or fifty-two or so, and then they pulled it. So, you know, previously the the precedent is is you know thresholds have been far lower. We have tens of thousands of deaths linked um, now uh, to the COVID nineteen vaccines, and still no. No, no questioning. Nothing from no, the nope. from the official. But, but that shows you the change in media during the swine flu. You had Mike Wallace on TV who did a report talking about the harms and the need to stop this when they did real investigative journalism. Now it's sort of like everybody is funded. Private media is funded by manufacturers, so the media cannot be independent. Let's just say the fact, right? It's they can't. Are you aware of the Trusted News Initiative? I'm, I'm, uh, I, I've heard of it. I haven't really uh, looked at it much. So the Trusted News Initiative was something uh, that uh, was set up to cover the American elections in 2020. And then uh, when COVID came along, um, it, it, it morphed into a, a body to prevent Vac- harmful vaccine misinformation. 
So it was set up to protect the the vaccine manufacturers right. and the vaccine narrative. And so I came across it because whenever I spoke about ivermectin, I was uh, censored and and everything was deleted and removed and 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 I was discredited um, because that was considered uh, putting forward treatments for for COVID was considered uh, vaccine misinformation. It would undermine the vaccine uh, rollout and the vaccine campaign. And the the subscribers to the Trusted News Initiative are the BBC, Reuters, Financial Times, Google, Twitter, Microsoft, um, Facebook. And so it's quite evident um, to see how they managed to wrap up holding all the media, how they managed to absolutely um you know, uh, wrap up and prevent any uh, alternative um, narratives, in fact, the truth from from reaching people. You know, most people say, well, how can it be possible? But it can be possible if your mainstream or your, your corporate media mm -hmm. uh, link up with all the social media, corporate social media channels. Um, it is, and, and they've demonstrated that it is possible to keep the truth from people for a period of time. But it's certainly not. Um, it's it's not going to be forever because the truth is coming out everywhere. And and um, and thank you again for for coming to speak about your experiences today. Thank Can, you for giving us the opportunity. Really, because, yeah. Thank you. Uh, every 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 opportunity we get is a chance to show people that we are real and we're not rare. Do you um, have any opinion on the regulation, the regulatory process of these of these uh, COVID injections? Do you think do you think failures in the regulatory process may be the reason My, why the the governments keep uh, denying vaccine injury, for example? I mean, I, I'll let Robert maybe speak, but I will. I will just add. I think there. You know, we know that with emergency use authorization, right? They were wide ranging uh, freedoms from liability, and we do know that in the manufacturing process, um, you know, there 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 was not great oversight, especially in the beginning. I mean, remember they were already producing millions of doses prior to even getting FDA authorization. So it was almost like a done deal, right? You don't produce millions of doses of vaccine when you think you might not get an approval. So the, it was almost like de facto. But I mean, look at the, the J&J &J, uh, experience. They had to waste uh, millions of doses, right? Because there were problems with them. So nobody knows because so much was done so quickly in uh, the, the, no one knows the, the quality control. It wasn't like there were FDA officials at every manufacturing plant watching every lot and every batch coming out and watching if it was shipped under the proper conditions, if there was consistency. So I think that there, you know, there, there's a lot to, to, ask about there right there's a lot to investigate but because of the eua no one cares because it doesn't matter anyway even if they found that there were flaws or gross negligence what can you do you have really no recourse and i think for me that's the biggest shock of my life i mean imagine i am a nurse practitioner i'm deeply rooted in traditional medicine I'm deeply rooted in science, you know, evidence-based practice medicine. I was my whole life uh, advocate of vaccinations that were well studied, right? So for me now to sit here as somebody severely injured, it is like a mind-blowing epiphany of things I never saw before. Like uh, I always say the me today would never believe what what's happened two years ago i'd be looking at myself and saying a person's crazy but now i am like shocked because i'm living it right i am really uh living in the shadows and completely abandoned and we have absolutely no recourse well, for as a, action as a, yeah, as a fellow health professional i can 
empathize with that because I was, you know, I also have have totally trusted the system. And mm -hmm. uh, had I taken the vaccine, I could quite easily be in your position now. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm fortunate that I, I postponed the decision. But, uh, um, you know, I just, uh, it's it's just yeah. devastating to hear, you know, what has happened to you. Right. And I think the other failure, and then I'll, I'll pass on to Rob, is that part of EUA is I really believe as a, somebody who's also a researcher, right, and has done clinical drug trials is, there wasn't really fully informed consent, right? The mass media blasted safe and effective, but there was no equal message saying, hey, these are emergency use authorization products. If you take this, the full risk is on you. Yes, there is a small program called the CICP or Countermeasures Injury Program, but it's broken. And your chances of getting any compensation from there are nil. But they didn't send that. And that's fully informed consent. And I think every citizen on the planet, that's a fundamental human right to have hum to have informed, full informed consent when you're being given a medical product, especially an emergency use authorization product, which has enormous protections from liability. Yes, and and which is a novel product that hasn't actually been used before. With, yeah. Yes, with no long-term human safety studies. Yeah. Into that. Robert, would you like to um, share your opinion on what Sean has said? A absolutely. Um, I mean, we can say that we've seen, you know, in the history of vaccines, that there are vaccines that work and have helped humanity. You know, we have things like the polio vaccine, et cetera. Um, and, and they've been proven to work and they've been proven to call, you know, to ease a lot of, you know, suffering and disease in the world. But th these things that they gave us this, I mean, some people call the mRNA vaccines experimental gene therapy. You know, we, we don't know. Regardless, like Sean said, these these so-called vaccines were basically rubber stamped before they were even officially approved to roll out. Um, and in the early trials, we've seen that people were injured, severely injured that are still struggling to this day. Um, you know, and, and the NIH lied and said that they treated these people and these people recovered. They're still not recovered. They're in our group. They're still struggling to survive every single day. And they basically just bypassed that entire part of the process, just rubber stamped these things and rolled them out. And as soon as the deaths and the injuries and everything started happening, happening, instead of admitting to it and, and putting a pause on it or, or even trying to slow it down or even acknowledge it, they just silenced it. They buried it. And, and I saw that the entire medical community was complicit in this, aside from a few, you know, brave individuals, brave doctors, nurse practitioners, et cetera, that stood up and spoke the truth. A lot of these doctors were were terrified to to admit what they saw was going on right in front of their eyes. I mean, I'm one of the few lucky ones that had uh, a doctor who was brave enough to stand up in the very beginning and make sure that on my hospital records, my official medical records, it's, it's listed that the Pfizer vaccine is what did this to me. A severe, quote unquote, allergic reaction to the Pfizer, you know, COVID vaccine did this to me. Um, but most people don't have that. So to this day, there's people that are struggling, mm -hmm. people that are losing their lives, people that have lost their jobs, their homes, everything, that don't even have anything on their medical records to say what caused this. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I've spoken to other people before about this, and, and I may be one of the outliers, but uh, I was one of the people that didn't necessarily trust these vaccines in the beginning. Um, but I took them because I had a job opportunity that was going to put me overseas, and I had to get it for travel reasons. Um and I was one of those people, and, and I'm, I'm sure this is laughable, but I was in the mindset that it was 5 to 10% of the vaccines that were causing all of the damage. So I figured I probably had about a 95% chance of getting a safe vaccine. Um, and by safe vaccine, what I mean is, if we look at the example, and, and I'm sure you can look this up and verify this, there was that one individual in Germany who received, uh, if I remember correctly, it was 80-some uh, COVID vaccines. Uh, he was getting paid by people who wanted uh, vaccine passes um, 
to take vaccines for them. Um, and he was later arrested and charged for that. It's in mainstream media. This exists. This was, uh, I think, last year. Um, so my question is, how does one human being manage to get 80 some vaccines and is walking around perfectly fine? Yet there's other people in perfect health that get one shot and drop dead within hours or days or, you know, end up like us where we're severely debilitated with all of these issues you know, two years out, how do you explain that? Because there's no doubt in my mind, we didn't all get the same thing. And this speaks to exa exactly what Sean said, the entire process. I mean, we know at this, at this point, because it's out there in, in the media that, you know, the Department of Defense has a lot to do with the oversight rollout of these vaccines. What, why does the Department of Defense have anything to do with these vaccines? Why isn't it the NIH, the CDC, the FDA? Like, it, to me... There's something profoundly different with every single step of the process with the way these vaccines have been rolled out compared to every other vaccine we've ever had in, in medical history before. And, and that, to me, is what's disturbing. And, and the fact that, you know, we're still covering this up and not discussing any of the, the collateral damage um, which is on a massive scale. Let's not underplay this. It's on a massive scale. There are hundreds of thousands of people around the world, if not millions, that are damaged by these things. This is a reality. Um, but, you know, let me let me preface to say that I, I found that a lot of people that are, you know, anti-vaxxers, and, and I'm not going to say I'm not anti-vax at this point, like I'm anti these vaccines, because there's no net benefit to these things. Uh, I've I just seen several articles um, and medical, medical journal papers recently that, that stated that people that have been vaccinated, especially with the boosters, are having worse outcomes uh, once they get COVID again than the unvaccinated or people who've had less vaccines. And that confuses me. So what is the net benefit to these vaccines as opposed to the gain? I, I don't I don't see it there. Um, and I don't see why there's this eagerness, um, you know, in, in the system to suppress any kind of early treatment or other kind of antiviral or medical intervention, yet they still continue to push these vaccines, which have obviously failed miserably and have caused a huge amount of suffering and, and death and, and damage. And that, I, I can't wrap my head around. Why continue down that path? Why, why are people like digging their heels mm -hmm. and still pushing these poisonous, toxic things? Because that's the reality of it. They're poisonous and they're toxic. And, that, and that's, you know, I'm sure there's some people that would disagree with me, but, but to me, this is what we're experiencing. This is what we're living with. And then, you know, I've, I've talked to people that have had, you know, four vaccines and they're totally fine. How do you explain that? They, they try and say that the majority of us that are injured were unhealthy or we had some pre-existing conditions. But I highly disagree with that because the majority of people that have been damaged by these vaccines are, uh, you know, in their teens up until their 50s. And most pre had previously no pre-existing conditions, were healthy people, um, and, and now they're, they're destroyed. But there's not a lot of, you know, I'd say sick and unwell people that are, that are walking around with issues from these vaccines. Um, you know, I, I, I can personally attest to this. I have friends that never got the vaccine. Um, every single one of them is, is still fine. They've had COVID a couple of times. Uh, I have friends that have been vaccinated and a couple of them have ended up, you know, in the ICU after having COVID. I, I can't understand that. Again, I'm not trying to minimize COVID because I know personally, I know people who have died from COVID that have never been vaccinated. Um, and, and this, if, if you don't mind, if I segue here real quick, but this is another issue I'm finding is that there's a lot of people that are really supporting us in, in, the suffering that we're going through with these vaccines and they're very anti COVID vaccine. And I'm, I'm fine with that. I agree with that. They're on our side. That's great. But at the same time, a lot of these people are also COVID minimizers and anti maskers. And if you don't want to wear a mask, like that's your right, that's your freedom, whatever, that's your opinion. But to say that COVID is harmless, it, it minimizes the whole thing. It's absurd. I mean, we know that people have died from COVID. I personally know you know, a lot, quite a few people who have long haul COVID who have never been vaccinated. So to completely take that out of the equation and say COVID is harmless, but these vaccines are killing people. It, it, it's, a, it's a binary statement. Like it's basically saying 
there's two outcomes from the vaccines. Either you don't get them and you live or you get them and, and you drop dead. But the reality is that there's everything in between and we are that suffering that's in between, but nobody seems to have an interest in us. They just want to talk about, like Sean said, all the horrible deaths and all the, you know, the, the injustice and, and outrage of it. But at no point is everybody saying there's, you know, all these people around the world whose lives have been completely destroyed, whose health is destroyed, whose time is running out, yet mm -hmm. they have no sense of urgency. No, no interest whatsoever in trying to find therapy. And, would, trials, and wouldn't you want to know? That is my, as a researcher, you know, uh, and, I, and maybe I'm on a different uh, plane than Robert, but as a researcher, I'm always like, why don't they want to know? This is a novel product. Like, wouldn't you want to know everything? I, I have never had COVID yet. It's two years. I have blood tests to show that. I'm like... Why wouldn't they bring me in, take specimens from me, uh, you know, to store them, to understand what what could be driving these possible harms so that we could make them safer, right? So even if you want to continue with them, wouldn't we want to investigate these thoroughly to make them safer, improve them, make them something that would work, uh, you know, to society's benefit with less harm, but nothing. Um, what I get is people s will say like, well, what makes you so special? There's people with other diseases who are desperate for therapies and treatment. But there is a difference. This, this is something that was mandated for many people. This is something the government asked us to do, uh, you know, for our part, for the for society, which I gladly did. I want it to end the pandemic. But I think if your government asks you to do something for them, they should be there for you when it goes wrong. Correct. I and mean, if you if you mandated something, if you for healthy people, if you mandate something for healthy uh, men, women, and children, it shouldn't make them sick. You know, right. intervention should not and put me into medical financial disarray. Yeah. yeah. But but the other thing in the shadows, and I hope maybe you can speak a little bit, Tess, is like now, like I said, we're at this pivotal moment. And I and I talk about the three R's right now, research, remedies, and recourse. That is my focus. I want research for the injury uh, injured. I want remedies investigated. And I want some change so we have some recourse of action for a compensation. But maybe we could switch gears and talk a little bit about some remedies because what we, we we're in this world where it's like Robert said vaccines or or no vaccine you get COVID or not COVID but there's there's so much in the middle like where is all the research on other therapies for besides vaccine early intervention therapies or treatments for you know that people could be taking for for COVID prevention we know there's a lot of information and products on, out there that people could be looking at but we hear nothing it gets squashed out yeah robert i mean i'm sorry sean i i can just say what um you know what we're doing at world council for health so world council for health is a grassroots organization and you know like you we've asked many questions and we get no responses but what we are hearing is we're getting feedback from practitioners uh at the grassroots level integrative practitioners so not just the allopathic uh you know medical doctor sort mm -hmm. but all sorts of healers and they're coming and saying look this seems to be working and this seems to be working and this seems to be working so um there isn't um you know it's not a study there are no studies but it's experiential it's people's experiences and this is how things have been discovered before it's by people's right. experiences so that's why the experiences of both these practitioners and people who've been injured um, bringing forward this information is absolutely crucial and valuable at this time. And I feel that this is the way research is going to move forward on this, is really from um, people who've been injured, trying things, and and for practitioners right. who've, who've uh, experienced in treating other sorts of things like uh, autoimmune diseases and that in a, in a, in a, in a, in a naturopathic, integrative right. way, um, you know, th this is the way we're going to, move forward on research right. what do you think i i also you know i i have to say you know and again i i go back i'm i've been more entrenched in conventional medicine but i've always had a side interest in non-conventional 
therapeutics and, and spent a lot of time studying that. Uh, in my work in infectious diseases and people with HIV and other immunocompromised conditions, but I have to I have to admit and and really state that functional med and uh, uh, non conventional um, medical practices have really been there for the injured and stepped up to fill that void and have offered at least motivation and and trials of things like you said. And, and have been a lifeline for many of us. And we have seen some successes. I mean, we have seen the bar move, you know, in terms of trialing things that people wouldn't necessarily consider, right? So, you know, we're looking at things like natokinase uh, and that role in mediating uh, the spike protein. We're looking at uh, a supplement called Tutka which is based on studies of orsodial, which is used often for liver patients, but there's a supplement form. And that studies have shown that that has uh, capacity to help prevent uh, the SARS virus from entering ACE2. Um, so there's a, I think there's a lot of um, alternative ideas out there that need really exploring and, and focus because until we get something uh, in addition from conventional medicine, we're, we're really lost. Um, and we continue to worsen to like, in my case, I'll just add quickly that, you know, I'm two years into it, but two weeks ago, you know, my right side was hit very hard by the vaccine. And on the weekend, I had sudden loss of hearing. So it's still not done with me. I, my suffering continues. I haven't slept for days because with the loss of the hearing, the tinnitus goes through the roof. So I have like blaring, howling, hissing in the side of my head and nerve pain that shoots up into the side of my brain and through my ears. So can you imagine I'm two years and I'm like, it's, it's just relentless. What, and we have no idea what is happening inside our body. So imagine the fear. Like, I, I don't know what tomorrow brings for me. Robert, you w were going to jump in there as well. Yeah, um, I, I can say this. Um, I, I'll agree with Sean that, you know, obviously uh, mainstream allopathic Western medicine is, is really kind of failing us right now. Um, with my own personal experiences, I, I've done 40 sessions of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Uh, that helped me a little bit. Uh, I do red light therapy. Uh, treatments every every day or I'd say five, six days a week from home, uh, which helps with mitochondrial function. Um, you know, I use a huge amount of supplements, uh, which unfortunately are very costly. Um, but the one thing from from a natural standpoint that's helped me dramatically um, is medical acupuncture. Um, and and I want to I want to clarify that this is, you know, acupuncture um, being given Chinese medicine uh, by an MD. Uh, medical acupuncture, not, you know, from a chiropractor or a physical therapist or something like that, but from an actual MD. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Burgoon, uh, if you don't mind me mentioning is, is amazing. He's a, he's a lot, uh, God save, uh, life, life saver. He, um, he, he was an internist, uh, an ER doctor. Um, and he decided to study Chinese medicine years ago and he's been doing medical acupuncture for years. Um, the only symptom relief I have is from you know medical acupuncture um which which amazes me i would have never thought that something like that could really help um the the problem is that there are people like the doctor i'm going to out there who are helping people i mean obviously it's, it's not necessarily a cure um but it's it's helping you know the suffering and, and helping with with just basic daily function the problem is that there's a lot of um functional medicine doctors naturopaths that are um, that are preying on us, uh, and even mainstream doctors that are preying on us, that, that are very predatory. And, uh, and this is sickening. But, you know, in all this suffering, we have doctors out there who we have some doctors who said, basically, you know, this thing that they put in you, you're all going to be dead in three to five years, like outrageous, you know, alarmist statements like that. But hey, in the meantime, I also have a bunch of supplements to sell you. So which one is it? Are we all going to drop dead in three to five years? So in the meantime, you're just going to sell us a bunch of supplements that are useless. That doesn't make sense. Then you have, you know, other doctors that basically say, oh, you can meditate yourself out of this. You can, 
you know, do yoga and breathing to get yourself out of this. I'm not saying that that can't help as an adjunct therapy. It's, it's definitely everything helps. Every part of this helps. And people that just say, I want a magic pill that's going to get me better. It's not going to work because we need everything in an, you know, out there to help us. But at the same time, we are so severe that we need some kind of serious, serious medical intervention. Um, and I do want to clarify this, what they're finding with people with long haul COVID and, and not necessarily just the vaccine, but long haul in general, is that there's there's two basic subsets of people with long, long haul. There's the people that recover in six to eight months to a year. Um, and, and there's not many, but there are some that are doing that. And then you have the people that go a year and a half, two years out. And, and what they're saying now is that those of us that are this far out, basically, we're in the same category as people with MECFS. Um, you know, they don't know this definitively yet, but this is kind of like where they're going. The long haul COVID clinic uh, that I was involved with at Johns Hopkins, that's what the head of the long haul COVID clinic said there. Basically, you all have MECFS. There's no cure. There's nothing we can do for you, which is absurd. Why, why would you even open a long haul COVID clinic and then give people defeatist ideas like that? It's pointless. But the reality is, yes, time is running out for us because you know, studies have been shown time and time again, if you look into the research of, you know, people like Ron Davis and, and other people who have been working on MECFS for years that, you know, at, at the three year mark, our bodies change. There's something inside of us um, that, that our immune system, the way our body functions and, you know, it tra transfers ATP and uh, throughout our body, our mitochondria function, it begins to change. And once that change happens, it's pretty much irreversible. So I'm not saying all doom and gloom. There are people that are recovering at two and a half years. There's people that are recovering at three years, you know, but with these vaccines, we just don't know. What we do know is that when it comes to things like MECFS, which have been around for what, at least been studied for 50, 60 years, and we still ha have gotten almost nowhere with, um, that the, the route to go with that is to just psychologize it until people eventually just end up completely bed bound and unable to care for themselves. And then once people are bed bound, unable to care for themselves and un unable to advocate for themselves, then we just dismiss them because they can't speak for themselves. Um, I, I can say, you know, from experience, um, I I'm friends with a, a fellow citizen of yours, um, another person from the UK, and um, she had MECFS before and, um, and she was, struggling with MECFS, um, you know, it's a life ruining, debilitating illness, which is still not being addressed. But she got vaccinated, hoping that that would, you know, help her from worse outcomes with COVID. It actually destroyed her. And, um, and she said that, I mean, she can't even use her legs now. She's pretty much in a wheelchair. And that wasn't from the MECFS, that was from the vaccines. So think about people who, you know, like us were previously healthy, and now our lives are you know, significantly damaged. But then not only that, but the people who already had some kind of pre-existing illness or something brought on by a flu or a virus or whatever, that then took these experimental vaccines and now are just at a whole different level of suffering. Um, it, it, it's just, it's just heartbreaking to me, you know? Um, and, and I, and I see it happening, you know, all around the world, it's every country. I have friends in Italy. I, I've, you know, dual citizenship. So, um, you know, I'm a citizen of the EU as well. And, um, you know, I have friends in Italy who, who are suffering and struggling with this. I have friends in the UK, I have friends everywhere who are literally going through the same hell we are. And every single country, there is just no acknowledgement besides a handful of doctors, you know, like yourself, um, you know, like Professor Pretorius in South Africa. Um, you know, there's doctor, a couple of doctors here in the United States that, that actually are trying to help us, that really care, um, that are looking ways for ways to treat us. But unfortunately, there are a lot of doctors out there that are taking advantage of us and are just being extremely predatory right. and making a lot of money. Think, right. Which I mean, I have some I have some good doctors that try to help me. The problem is they don't they don't know how, right? Because we don't have the research to understand what is going on. So they're like, we we're doing our best based on the limited information we know. But I do want to echo what Robert said is that, uh, you know, in this two year mark, it, there is some kind of very disturbing trends of uh, what I call charlatan physicians and doctors who are trying to prey upon us. And they know we're easy picking now in our despair and they're charging exorbitant fees 
and then just prescribing trial and error medicines that you know we at react 19 where where i volunteer when i'm well we we have researched and gathered all this information on everything that the injured have been doing and trying and what is working and what isn't working and then they adopt these as their protocols and charge people like a thousand five hundred to two thousand dollars for a few visits via telehealth can't even lay their hands on a patient or or look at lab analysis and they're just pres- remote prescribing them all kinds of therapies. And it's, a, it's very disturbing. Don't get me wrong. I'm grateful for the help. But I don't like to see people who are injured and in despair abused and monetized. And I think that we need to call out now because it's happening and uh, the fees just keep going up. And we haven't been seeing people dramatically getting better. Amen to that. Yeah. Sean, how do you manage to keep despondence at bay? I, I, thinking of all the people in your situation, um, how do you how do you stay afloat and keep balanced and keep going one you know one one day at a time? Let me tell you, Tess, it's hard. I I'm 53 years old, right, and I have I have cried rivers of tears almost every day since this has happened to me. I, I will confess that because people need to know, like I, I break down, I have my meltdowns, I have rage, I have anger, I have sadness, I have grieving for my former self. But I think like, if you lose hope, what you have nothing left, right? So you have to keep your razor sharp focus on hope that you can heal that you can get better, that you can beat this, that you'll, with time, people will listen, they will help you, we will find something. And then I keep going for all the other people that reached out to me, who were harmed, that I have helped. We're like a family now, we carry each other day by day. Like Rob will tell you, he will call me, I will call him. If I don't hear from him, I'll be like, how are you? I haven't heard from you. Are you okay? We do a lot of that. Do you, I mean, that sounds like an enormously positive thing too, that you have a, a network of people that perhaps you would never have met before or interacted mm-hmm. with before. Um, is that something to, that, that keeps you, um, keeps your, your faith and trust in, in the world and, and in life itself? Absolutely. I mean, we have, I have met some amazing people on this journey that I would have never have crossed paths with. Right. And so we, even in tragedy and despair, you, you learn, you grow, you change. Sometimes it's not the way you want, but you know, we can't always choose the path that's given good things happen. Bad things happen to good people, let's say. And, um, yeah, but without each other, you know, I mean, this is the nature of medicine, right? You find support groups everywhere and you, you it's the sharing and caring. It can work to our detriment too, right? Because you don't want to always be focused on your suffering. There is a mental component to healing, right? We know this, right? If, you, if you've resigned yourself to being chronically ill and you feed that, you're likely not going to get any improvement. You're going to just exacerbate your symptoms. So I think you have to keep that mental sharpness and focus on the the healing component, right? And still every day trying to look for some little bit of joy. Um, always looking for the joy to to keep yourself going and not always focusing on the illness. And I think that's part of acceptance and of where you're at and trying to move forward in your new body. I mean, I have to, I have to say, you know, I don't want to belabor the point, but you know, I, I also understand that doctors that, or practitioners, health practitioners, they also have expenses and overhead and they need to cover costs. But I'm talking about these egregious mm. individuals who really, you know, who, who, who overtly prey upon us. I'm not, so I, I wouldn't, paint a broad brush stroke that it's it's you know widely prevalent but i think it is occurring and uh we do need to protect people in despair from you know 
those kind of charlatans who who just are seeking money and uh, yeah, not. You you co-founded React Nineteen. Does React Nineteen have a list of health practitioners that they recommend that people can turn to? We are trying to collate a list of people who at least are who have been helpful or open uh, to the idea. Um, and we try to navigate. We're always asking for feedback from the injured community on who they have seen, where they have gone for help, who has been helpful, who hasn't been helpful. Also, what therapies they have taken, what labs they have done, what has shown up positive, what has shown up negative. We do our best, but you have to remember we're we're the injured helping the injured. So it's not like we're all fully functioning. It takes 10 of us to make one person sometimes. But we do, we have done a lot, I have to say, in the two years, uh, or I would say a little less than two years that we've started. I mean, if you look at the website, we have compiled enormous amounts of information and really my hat's off to um, Bree Dressen and Joel Wall, Dr. Joel Walskog for for everything that they have done. They have really laid the foundation. Um, so I'm so grateful. Absolutely. I mean, it's 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 amazing to think what we have done in short period with with such sick individuals, but. We've had a lot of medical professionals that were injured and we came together and, you know, we, we used what brain power we had to help others, which yes. is what we do as humans, right? We don't leave people aside. We're not, like I always say when I write, we're not human collateral damage. We're humans suffering who need help. And that. It is interesting, actually, how, you know, with COVID, it started with all the social distancing and how that social, it, it actually has ended up bringing us together in a way that we would never have, have dreamt of. If, um, if I could speak to something with um, my experience with um, mainstream doctors, if I could add something on here. Um, I, I will say this, that I have seen a shift in the beginning uh, of my personal experience, and I've heard this from other uh, vaccine injured as well. Um, we would go to doctors telling them what we thought was happening to us, and they would literally just roll their eyes and just, you know, tr try and be the good ones would try and be nice about it. But basically, you could tell they didn't believe us. Something has happened because at least in my case, there's been a huge shift in what some of these doctors are saying to me now. Um, one of my cardiologists actually said to me recently, um, and, you know, I believe everything you've said. I, I'm sorry that I doubted you for as long as I did with, with the things that were, you know, you were talking about a year ago because uh, we're finding out a lot of that's true now. Um, and if there's anything that you can tell me that I can share with people in my own life that I know that are vaccine injured, I'd appreciate it. My primary care physician, same thing. He said, I have some patients that are vaccine injured. I don't know what to do with them because there's nothing coming. There's no guidance coming. Can you talk to them? Can you help them? I have no medical background. I don't have a right to help anybody. All I can do is give them advice from what I've learned from other vaccine injured. Um, I, I had a doctor, and I can't mention the name of the of the, the 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 hospital, but I did have a doctor early on who told me, um, "I'll confide this in you that um, I believe everything that's happening to you. I'm seeing it happen with other vaccine injured." Um, but we're being told by higher ups uh, in our medical system that we are not allowed to acknowledge uh, or work with you. Uh, he told me that. He said, I'll never admit this publicly, but this is something that, that, that bothers me. That I see this happening, but we're getting a lot of pressure from higher up to basically not acknowledge you. And that was specifically because, you know, the system that he works with had uh, a direct involvement with the development of one of the vaccines. So obviously these, these doctors are getting a huge amount of pressure um, to not acknowledge us, to not treat us. Even if it's not directly from higher up, like in this one doctor's case, it could just be a lot of um, pressure from their colleagues that, you know, say, well, how can you admit something like that? Like th these people are just, you know, it's, it's emotional, it's mental. 
Uh, I can't tell you how many doctors try to prescribe SSRIs to me early on. I refuse to take them, but every doctor's like, oh, you have anxiety. Yeah, of course I have anxiety. I feel like I'm dying every single day. I think that's normal, but it's not a psychological thing. It's, it's a you know, physiological thing that's going on with us. And um, like Sean said, we have no idea what they put inside of us. We, we still, they still can't explain to us what they, what they put inside of us. So we don't know short-term, long-term what the outcomes of, of these injections are. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's hard enough to cope with when you're, when you're brought down by an illness like a virus or, or cancer, things like that. That's, that's, it's awful. But when it comes from something that was injected into your body, you feel like uh, it, it's a very bitter pill to swallow. Like you feel like you were violated. You feel like somebody took your, your personal freedom away. Somebody, and I know this sounds kind of silly, but it, it feels like almost like somebody severed your, your connection with your own nature, with your own, you know, who you are. Um, and, and a lot of us have experienced that. We've gone through derealization. We've gone through this, this idea that like, we're not even in our own bodies anymore because something has happened to us. Um, you know, and over time that, that starts to change, it seems to improve. Um, but I can understand the amount of despair that people are having, the reason that, you know, the people ha have killed themselves because we all feel that way. Every single one yeah. of us, I can't, I haven't found one person who's vaccine injured who hasn't said, I haven't contemplated suicide many times. That's a reality. The one thing I can say to everyone who, who still contemplates suicide is, we all think this, we all feel this, we're all in the same place as you. But, uh, and I said this to, to, to somebody else before, um, once you're dead, you're dead. You can't fix dead. You can't undo that. If you decide at the last second you want to change your mind, it's too late. So sticking around for, for a chance at hope, for a chance that someday there may be some kind of recovery for us mm -hmm. is why we need to hold on it. And we need to hold on for each other and for our families. And, you know, for those of us in this world that, that, that love us and care about us. I mean, right. in, in the very beginning, I, I was in such despair. The only thing that pulled me through was, you know, my friends and family and, um, you know, a doc doctor friend of mine who was retired, Mitch, thank you very much. I mean, he helped me, you know, through every step of the way when I was in hospitals, these doctors were, were gaslighting me. And he kept telling me, tell them to give you this test, tell them to give you that test. And they would keep, keep saying, there's no reason for that. Every test he told me to get came back positive with something. So there are doctors out there that acknowledge what's happening to us, that know what's happening to us and do care. And every day, I think there's more and more of them. They just have a lot of pressure not to speak. So we understand even with the mainstream doctors, um, what's going on, like why why they're afraid to help us. And I think it's important. I think it's important to also focus on to to just elaborate on what you're saying is to focus on things that ease your suffering in the interim, right? There may be no cure today, but there are many things you can do, right, to ease your suffering until you get to the day when there might be something to help you, whether it be a massage or acupuncture or red light or a cup of chamomile tea and a meditation or, you know, like um, there's so many things you can try to do. To, like with me, with my severe tinnitus, I do sound therapies. I try, I just keep trying and trying and trying anything to alleviate the suffering, make every day, every, everything a little bit better. And I think that people should focus on that. And I think that's the mind shift from like being focusing on the pain or the suffering and shifting that focus to like, what can I do to alleviate that until there's better days ahead? Yeah, I agree with that. Wow, you guys um, are so inspiring. Uh, I just wanted to say, you know, based on what you've just said, Sean, and also picking up on the point that Robert said, you know, the doctors are saying to him, you know, well, you guys, you know, tell me how I can help people who've been vaccine injured, you know, what what's working for you. I think it just shows, you know, you have a, a, an amazing and valuable contribution to make and help us solve this puzzle. The doctors can't do it without you. Um, and so, you know, um, we need you. The doctors need you. We need to know. Um, we need to know what's helping you, and um, and we need it, all the information we can get that will come forward from React Nineteen. You know, and and um, and 
individual men and women uh, who are struggling at the moment. So please, um, you know, bear that in mind and keep sharing with us so that we can we can help others. Because just by coming on the podcast today, people hearing you speak is helping. You know, will be helping many many others uh, in your situation. And and uh, you know, such inspiring words that will help people keep going and um, and uh, you know going the going the distance until there is something that will help them thank you so much for having us and giving us to giving us this chance to update everyone on where we're at two years later would you like to just have, say one last thing a message to whomever you would like to say to be it the regulators or the doctors or other people suffering or the people who aren't aren't suffering uh, is there a message you'd like to give to any group in particular John, if you'd like to go first, yeah, I think for me the most important thing is the is the is the government system. I mean, we really we really need acknowledgement. It, everything starts with acknowledgement, and from there we need the research, the remedies, and and fix recourse. I mean, that's where we are today. I can't go back. I can't undo what has happened to me. I can only move forward, and I think that is my focus right now. We need the government to step up and put money aside to research what has happened. They need to put pressure on the manufacturers to look into these reactions, um, to understand what is what is going on on a biological level, and uh, to not only for the benefit of the injured, but for the benefit of si the safer vaccine going forward. You know, that is my message. Really, is that we need government action right now. And um, and I guess the second part would be we need the media to just stop the censorship, um, you know, and just painting us as fake news or misinformation or lumping us in with the anti-vax movement or anti-mandate people. I, I'm just me. I did what I was asked. I got harmed. And uh, here I am, you know, come see me, come visit me, see if I'm fake or not look at my medical records. I invite you. Um, anything to get us uh, to move beyond that narrative. Thank you. Robert? Uh, yeah, I did want to say um, one thing that's been kind of a, 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 a hard blow for us uh, recently is that um, they do have uh, a couple um uh, groups, universities in the United States here who have uh, recently taken on researching and studying long haul COVID and uh, vaccine injury. Um, and they are doing some testing now and uh, they are starting some small trials or will be hopefully this year. Um, but sadly, we just found out that those of us that are vaccine injured um, are specifically excluded from some of this testing. Um, and I don't believe it's because those doctors don't want to help us. I, I know they care. I can see it when they talk. Um, but because they're receiving government funding, they've specifically been told um, that we are excluded from these studies, these trials, these treatments. Um, and that's a pretty hard, you know, a hard blow for us right now. Um, so what I can say is if there's any doctors out there, if there's any groups, any researchers, anyone that wants to study us, that wants to help us in any way. We know there are a couple out there. I mean, I know there's a, you know, a doctor uh, here in the United States now who's, who's studying, uh, you know, the microclots and the, uh, and the vascular issues, uh, you know, coagulopathy issues with, with people with long haul COVID and vaccine injury, but that's only one in the entire United States. I mean, we need, we need more than that. Um, and we need immediate, immediate treatments, trials, therapies, anything. Um, so if there's any doctors out there, any researchers that care, um, we really desperately need your help. Um, and I, I know React 19 has really um, now shifted their focus towards finding treatments, trials, things like that. Um, so if anyone, you know, is interested, if each person could just donate $5, you know, to React 19, something like that. All that money, every penny of it, because it's completely nonprofit, would go towards research. We could could you know, get doctors that actually want to work and try and find cures and treatments for us and get them access to, you know, materials that they need to try and research us and help us. Um, just simple things like that. And then, 
lastly, uh, I, I know you see that Sean and I are here and we're talking and having a conversation. We seem normal. But what people don't see is, you know, especially our friends and families and those closest to us sometimes, they don't acknowledge that it's what comes afterwards. Like after Sean and I get off the phone, we're both going to be a mess for days. Like I'm going to be bed bound for probably two, three days. I'm I'm one of the lucky ones that I can manage to take myself to doctor's appointments now occasionally. Um, but every time I do that, there's a price to pay for that. I'm bed bound for two, three days at a time. I can't go for a walk. I can't, you know, do anything around the house. I can't exercise. I can't do anything. My body is basically like a prison. Um, so people only see us when we're our best. They don't see that other 85, 90% of the time where most of us are just completely debilitated and bed bound or just struggling. Um, and that's what, what I think people need to see, because if it's happening to us, it could happen to other people as well. And it's just a matter of time before more people get damaged like us. So anything that helps us will help all of us in the long run. Absolutely. Thank you so much to both of you and to everybody watching, please do go and have a look at the react 19 website. Do donate so these important research studies can be done and that uh, the those suffering can get uh, the support they need. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you Thank so much you for having us on. We really appreciate it. If you find something of value in these Test Talks videos, please consider supporting their production by making a donation or becoming a paid subscriber to our Substack. Thank you.